Hi, Dr. Rob. Hey, Tammy. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to our weekly Q&A webinar. And I'm here to answer questions and uh, supply information and try to do the best I can to um, help you understand a whole bunch of issues that are difficult to understand, that are, diff that are difficult to understand and you often can't get answers to. And Tammy and I are here every Monday night at five o'clock on sex and relationship healing for me to be able to offer um, whatever we can in terms of the information. And Tammy is my awesome sidekick. <laughs> Anyway, why don't we get started? You got, got any questions there? We've got questions. So for a sex addict who is engaged in proper recovery, what does general progression oh, I, I have to, what, of healing look like? Will the addict get to a point where he doesn't get triggered by other women or will he just get better at managing? As a former smoker, I still crave nicotine and it's been years, but I've gotten better at using tools so I don't go back there. I think it's about managing. And I know that, what we're, that spouses don't want to hear that. I understand that completely. But um, the way I think about addiction is, is really is a form of mental illness. And the reason I say that is when you think about depression or anxiety or any of those kind of chronic lifelong conditions, we know that they can be managed and people can do well for really long periods of time. But then if they don't do what they need to do, whatever that is, medication, self-care, they can slip back into depression or too much stress. Or, and it's really the same with addiction, that this is a hardwired Part of our brain it's burned in and unfortunately with sex it crosses the line into things that are normative like if i'm walking down the street and i'm with you and i love you and i see someone attractive i'm going to notice them and find them attractive that's normal i would hope that that you would find that healthy even however if you have a history of me lying and cheating and you know looking at other people and you know going after them it would be difficult for you to see me even glance at that person without feeling personally like oh you're not doing good or you're not so I think there has to be in the process some room for understanding that um, a sex addict is still a sexual being. It's like someone with an eating disorder. They still need to eat. They can't eat between meals. They may not be able to eat sugar. They may not be able to go to buffets, but they still are healthfully eating. And I want people to celebrate and enjoy their healthy sexuality, even with a partner, even if they have noticed someone else. I just don't want them to act on it. So. Um, and I will tell you that under stress and under the right kind of stress and a lack of self-care, addicts return to old behaviors and they need to, to sort of bolster themselves and get back into the game. And, and because it is chronic and because it is driven by stress and life circumstances, you know, the, even the person with the best recovery can end up, um, you know, falling on their face. And then you know what they do? They get back up and they go back to work. I think that that's really true. We had, I told my husband, I've been in recovery. He's never known me not in recovery. And he had, um, yeah, that is good. Um, that's really good. Um, I, you talk about the broken picker. He would have never picked me. I would have never picked him. So yeah, it's really good. But he had, he was making a sauce and he had a little container of beer open in the fridge. And I opened the fridge, didn't know it was there. And I looked and the first thought was, you know, you could drink this. And I just started laughing, you know, like, like that's, and he goes, really? He was like all upset and thinking he had, a, I said, no, I can always get that. But I said, that's still where my first thought is. Right. It's like, it's a fleeting thought. It left really quickly. I know all the ramifications of this. I know I don't want to do that, but it just kind of cracked me up. I was like, well, of course it's still, you know, it still pops in in random weird places. And I think a way to say that, a different way to say that would be that for the, for any addict, I believe that recovery is a choice every single day. How I choose to live, how I choose to act, how I communicate, um, how I take care of myself is either going to be a choice to or how honest I am, how real I am, uh, how much I care about other people. Really, every step we make is either a step toward being a healthy, contributing human being or it isn't. And God knows we all make steps away. But those steps away, if you make enough of them, are going to lead to relapse. And that's the problem of being an addict. You don't just have a bad week. You end up in real trouble. But you don't have to. But you don't have to. Do you have any advice for dating couples where the essay is early in recovery? Go slow. Um, so if you're involved with a sex addict, they're going to be used to leading their relationships, meaning trying to secure them and make them solid with a lot of seduction. And addicts can be, sex addicts in particular, we can be really seductive in a variety of ways. Many times you may think of seduction as just being sexual, like, you know, cleavage or, you know, big 
or muscle shirts or that could be seductive. But when I think of a seductive, I mean charm and being flirtatious and funny. And, you know, addicts can be very, use the skills of healthy people to remain in their addiction. And so if I were involved with an, an addict who was in early recovery, I would make sure, I would want to be sure that when he or she was taking me out to dinner, that they were doing it because they wanted to spend the evening with me and they were feeling good, you know, that they didn't want, weren't doing it because they had something they didn't want me to know about. Or in other words, I just never really trust the intentions of an addict in early recovery. It's not that I don't want to, and I'm not willing to say, okay, I'll trust you for today, but I'm still asking the questions. And so if I were starting to date someone, it would be very important to me that, you know, when we said, for example, okay, we're at a place where we don't want to see other people. Um, I would want to make sure that you run down. So that means you're not going to sleep with other people, call other people, look at their pictures, you know, because addicts will slice and dice all that kind of stuff, especially in the beginning. So just because someone says to you, oh, I would never be with someone else while I'm with you. Well, what does that really mean? What does being with someone else mean? It might mean something very else, something very different for the addict than it means for you. And so I think clarity on things like dating, sexuality, monogamy, going forward in the relationship, moving in, those, those things have to be get a lot more attention than they were when you're dealing with someone who's not newly in recovery or a healthy person. Although they're great skills anyway. Oh, well, I will say, and thank you, Tammy, that all the skills that I got from being an addict are useful in recovery. I'm not, I am not um, ungrateful for being able to influence people's feelings. That's a great skill for me as a therapist. It's just I used it in ways that were manipulative and seductive when I was acting out. Now I can use those same skills to help people or be a better person. That's why we don't regret the past as addicts. We find a way to come to terms with it. But even in the solid communication of dating skills of like having the conversation is what does that mean to you? I mean, that's just good dating skills because people, yeah. you know, get into trouble that don't have addiction issues in relationships because they're unclear about those things. It's so. a intimacy is an art and you need to practice a lot. So, yeah. Um, so thanks for the for your generosity. Just finished listening to Forrest Benedict's book. I feel overwhelmed. It feels impossible. I think I am frozen for fear of failing in any attempt for freedom from porn. I'm just not brave enough to even try to start. I hear this a lot and I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, Tammy, I don't think we talk about this much, but a lot of times when I was running, a, I, I do sex addiction, uh, we run a residential treatment center, so I do residential work now, but when I used to see people in outpatient, I would often have someone who comes in and they would just be angry, like, I'm not going to get that, I'm not going to do this, there's no point in that, you know, and what I would kind of realize after a while, it's kind of a subtle thing to notice, is that they didn't want to do it because they didn't want to fail, and they're feeling that if I, I've, and, and oftentimes for addicts, I've tried this a hundred times, I've tried to stop, I've done it a million ways, it always, comes, why hope for change? And, you know, if you've got any self-esteem left at all, you might not want to disappoint yourself one more time by hoping one more time. And I just want to tell you that I, I, I have this, I, this is my belief, and I think mm -hmm. it's useful. Um, those of us in the medical profession understand that when you put a, a body that is ill, in the right circumstances, like if you have a broken arm and you set it properly, that the body seeks to heal. So the body will seek to bend that bone and you maybe have a little bump, but I'm not gonna have a broken arm anymore because it was set properly. Well, if I put people in the right circumstances for healing, nine times out of 10, if they're motivated, they're gonna heal and they're gonna do a lot better in their recovery. And so, you know, um, I would never, I would always want to give someone the benefit of the doubt to try one more time. And I know that is for some of you the hardest thing in the world, but I have a feeling that the person who wrote this, Tammy, I could be wrong, but I bet they're under 30 or under 40. And if you've given up on trying and you're, you haven't even hit 35 yet, you've got a lot of ways to go in life before you're going to give up. So I would say try, but try with help. Try with support. Try with the knowledge that you may fall on your face and you're going to have to get back up again. Have a larger vision of what healing is than simply stopping the masturbation or stopping the porn. It might take you six months to stop the porn, but maybe you joined a team. Maybe you got to a 12-step meeting. Maybe you're going to therapy. Maybe you're doing things to improve your life and the behavior will follow when you feel stable enough for it to follow. So, you know, I would never, I would always encourage you to try one more time, knowing that the more likely you are to heal is related to the situations you put yourself in. One of the things I was thinking too is whether you go to a 12-step program, there's lots of different 
programs and things. But one of the things with the steps is they're steps. You do one at a time. It, it isn't that I have to do all of them all at once. Or if I'm on step one, I don't have to worry about step nine and 10, whatever. It's like, you just do the next right thing. That was one of the things that happened uh -huh. for me was just do the next right thing that I could do. And then I do the next right thing. And that was really you know, breaking it down rather than it being this overwhelming, you know, oh my gosh. And the always and forevers and nevers, you know, that was too hard and, and scary. And so um, if it's broken down into bite-sized pieces for me, then, you know, I can do that one thing. Okay. Next one, please suggest helpful ways to be available to an injured partner as the decision to decide to try working through gaining trust is being considered. Okay, I'm gonna have to review that question. Basically, they're looking for how can you support a betrayed partner right. who is trying to decide if they even wanna- Okay, well, I, I, I will say that I wrote a book about this um, called Out of the Doghouse. And it's a book for men who've cheated on women because I really think that men, um, have a hard time understanding the depth of pain that we can cause a woman when we cheat and therefore it's hard for us to heal the problem or help them understand that we're trying to because they may not we may not always have the best approaches or the right words or so i wrote a book called out of the doghouse a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating which is specifically to help you understand um what kinds of actions stances behaviors and words will help your spouse understand that you're sincere and dedicated and what kinds of actions behaviors and words will make your spouse feel like you're full of poop and um and i did that because so many men i work with really want to heal the harm that they've caused they just don't know how and they're impatient you know it's like okay it's been six weeks and i haven't cheated i've been going to 12 step meetings and i've been home on time and i've made dinner and when are you going to be nice to me and the answer is maybe in a year <laughs> and that's the truth and that's not wrong but it's not the answer a lot of us want to hear and so part of out of the doghouse is learning how to tolerate getting your needs met from a variety of people while your spouse is still angry at you and unavailable to do that um, but there is you're right a kind of path and pattern to the healing process and um, you know there are not lots of books about healing betrayal I would suggest you learn more about it so this um, is from the person that was feeling overwhelmed. So one of my problems is staying up late till like 3 a.m. binging on porn. Mm -hmm. How valid and beneficial would it be for me to have a goal to go to bed at 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. rather than watch porn? In other words, work on positive actions rather than the negative. Well, um, it never hurts to work on the positive. And I could absolutely tell you how to find recovery that way. And, and here's a thought for you. Um, there's a, a term called, um, Tammy might need to help me with sleep, maintenance, sleep. There's um, something to do with stability. Like if you are up till three in the morning, you're throwing the entire week off. And that may be okay if you're at a wedding and having a great time and it's worth it. But what you don't realize is you're emotionally going to be challenged for a number of days after that. And so, yeah, if you want to recover, forget the, I only look at porn when I stay up at light. How night, how, and so if I go home to bed early, I won't look at porn. How about... I need to have a stable time when I'm going to bed, no matter what's going on, because I, uh, it's not maintenance. Maybe someone else will think of the word, but sleep is extraordinarily important to our, our, our ability to resist being impulsive. When I'm tired, I got to tell you, it's like, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to do that, you know? And so if you're up till three in the morning and then you're at work by nine, you're already set up to be acting out because you don't have the internal ability to say no. So yes, I think setting up a, ma a real schedule for yourself, not so much about the porn, that'll fill in, but how, what kind of schedule is gonna mean I have a healthy life? You know, and that would be the best gift of all you can start giving yourself as a healthy life. And, and, and yes, sleep management, sleep maintenance, whatever you wanna call it, there is tons of research on, you know, how important that is. And even you can't make it up on the weekend or whatever. So, you know, so for me, creating a healthy schedule that I go to bed early, I get up and work out in the morning. You know, I, ha I have these things that are a positive routine for me, not, you know, and my life isn't gonna fall apart if I, you know, oversleep one morning or whatever. But for the most part, I follow this and it works really well for my life. Let me add to that, and thank you, Tammy, because you're right. Um, 
let me tell, I'll tell you a little secret about treatment. So I've run treatment centers and organized treatment centers for intimacy disorders and sex addiction for almost 25 years. I've worked in treatment centers. And now we own one and run one called Seeking Integrity, which I'm totally excited about. And if you want help and treatment, let me know. Just go to seekingintegrity.com. But in doing all of these years of treatment, you know, one of the things that I've really come to understand is, um, is that um, a lot of us are so used to um, feeling bad about ourselves that um, we don't need much to tip us over into self-hatred or shame or all I need to do is be at work and be a little tired and, and then remind myself why I'm tired and then I, I'm mad at myself all day because maybe this was a day I wanted to do something and I'm really mad at myself that I didn't do you know and so here's the the deal right I want it part of recovery and maintaining so well, let me try this another way Part of the way I maintain sobriety is by doing things that make me feel good about myself and not doing things that leave me feeling bad about myself. So if my patterns of behavior and how I'm resting, what I'm doing is leaving me feeling bad about myself the next day, it ain't working. So uh, just a little thought for you. Well, and there's a saying around 12 steps to um, halt hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And part of that is just the basic thing because we as active addicts don't really take good care of ourselves and we'll get, you know, we'll get too hungry and then I'm going to get cranky and you know, all of those things. So the more I can stay in that balance, the better off, the better I am and the less likely I am to uh, go off into my and halt, for example, which I just wrote down as, you know, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. What that means, the reason we give that to people, that acronym, it's a reminder. When you're in an addictive place, or if you're used to acting as an addict, you're probably not paying attention to the things that are some really basic things that are important. Like, I know many addicts will skip dinner because they're looking at porn, they're out cruising, they've gone six hours, and they're hungry. They had a fight with their boss that day, and they don't realize that that upset is going to be bothering them at home, they're angry. They have spent, uh, one of our major sources of acting out is a lot of unstructured time alone, like a holiday weekend with no plans and the family's away. So when we talk about hungry, angry, lonely, tired, what we mean is that we want you, the addict, to have extra awareness of these things that most people don't have to because most people don't slip into self-destructive behavior after a couple of nights bad sleep. They might have a fight with their boss, but where we go where we end up in the self-harm and harming our relationships around our addictions, we don't have the luxury of making a lot of mistakes around hungry, angry, lonely, tired. We have to be well-fed. We have to get our feelings out and work through them. We have to rest. And um, what's the last one? Hungry, anger. Oh, angry, lonely. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's just the way it goes. And the only reason is because we want to have stable healing. And there was one more thing I forgot to say, Tammy, and it was the reason I brought up treatment centers. What I want you guys to know is when I go in to set up a treatment center, whether it's for my program or somebody else's, the first thing we look at is structure. One of the most important things for a client in a treatment center is that the trains run on time. That if you're, if it's nine o'clock, everybody knows it's breakfast time. If it's 930, they all know we're in a group. If it's two o'clock, everybody's got workout or exercise. That's what I know about early recovery is that structure and stability and really being able to rely on yourself, if not an external source of structure, is extremely important. So if you can set up the kind of discipline that Tammy's talking about for yourself, you know, I work out in the morning, and not rigid, not I hate myself, I didn't do this today, but something to aim toward that you hopefully will be held accountable to, maybe checking in with somebody else, I exercise today, I'm going to bed now. Um, you're just gonna be so much further down the line in terms of being a healthier person overall. Yeah, I actually set up my exercise schedule so early on when I was just trying to get into this and I, I decided I had I had to for myself work out three times a week. So if it got to be and my workout week was Sunday through Saturday. So if I was busy on a weekend, I could still get it done. So if it got to be Thursday and I hadn't worked out, that meant Thursday, Friday and Saturday, I needed to work out. So it was just one of those things that was an accountability thing and it, it worked for me you know, to get on a plan. So next question, what's the best treatment for an addict that has multiple affairs and lies compulsively? Seems to be just addicted to meeting women online and then engaging in relationships that are not going anywhere and are more like fantasies while holding on, or while holding the real relationship the whole time. Okay, I'm not sure that how to answer it, but I do have a thought and let me give my thought. And so in my experience, all addicts, but sex addicts in particular, compartmentalize. 
and we tend to divide our lives up into things we want people to know about, things we don't want people to know about, you know, things we just let ourselves know about. And that's our lack of integrity, our lack of integration. We're this person over here and that person over there and whatever suits the situation um, because we want to get away with what we do and all of that. But in the same way, there are those of us who also compartmentalize our emotional lives. So I might take sexual excitement, lust, arousal and intensity and, and hot sexual fantasy and put that all in a box with strangers. And then my spouse kind of becomes my mom or my sister or my brother. We have the love, the friendship, the companionship, the, the fun when it's there. But my passion, intensity, and sexuality is all over there. And so I'm living a non-intimate relationship with my partner and engaging a lot of sexual intimacy and romantic intimacy with someone I barely know. And in those ways, we compartmentalize, we split our lives into boxes. And the recovery part is to put your life back in, together into one so that, you know, in your case, what you say, um, I guarantee you this guy, let me tell you what he's addicted to. When you say he's just addicted to meeting women online, engaging in relationships, not going anywhere, he's addicted to intensity. This is about, ooh, can I get her? Does she want me? And ooh, am I important? And ooh, and look, I said this, and now we're going, it's all about, it's so similar to compulsive gambling in a way. When a sex addict is approaching uh, a, a uh, target, it's like a, uh, someone sitting down at the blackjack table who's a compulsive gambler. They're just thinking like the next set of cards. And they're so into the intensity and the excitement of the game, they don't realize that they don't, they're running out of money. And this person is so into the intensity of, will I get that person? Will I get that partner? So, are we going to have sex? That they're ignoring their healthy life. And this has become been the place where they put all of that. Intensity for us is also a form of escape. So we use the affairs, the intent to kind of um, paint over our emotional challenges, our brokenness. When we are having some struggle, we don't turn to you as a partner and say, honey, I'm having a really bad day. We just go out and have sex with a stranger. We use the intensity to escape. And so integrating our lives so that you and family members and friends and people in recovery are the ones I go to with everything that's going on with me. I don't take some emotional state or some issue and go off here and handle it. I handle everything openly, even if it's difficult with for me in front of the people I'm involved with. That sense of integrity and bringing life into one, not I'm living over here doing this and living over there doing that is recovery. Um, and if you ask what kind of program, I mean, when you say, this person has multiple affairs, lies compulsively, and is meeting people online, that's every sex addict I've ever met. So I don't think the treatment is specifically different for them. They need to get to a therapist who is qualified, or if there's a crisis and the acting out is unabated or the family's in a crisis, you need to go to a treatment center and separate yourself for a while and get to work. Um, there, you know, there are many paths. I say pick one and get to work. But I wouldn't say your husband's any more special or different because of what you described. That sounds like escaping into intimacy with strangers and compartmentalizing my life is what every addict who's here does. Okay. What typically pushes an addict to face reality and choose recovery? About to start divorce process initiated by PMO addict hub, hubby, and he doesn't see this as What's a consequence. PMO? Sorry, PMO. I think porn masturbation. I'm not sure what. Obsession, oh, Obsession, maybe. Obsession, probably. That could be. Uh, and doesn't see this as a consequence, rather as a relief from his misery. Right. He has agreed to lose custody of our eight-month-old dar uh, in the process because he just wants out. Currently, he hates me and is convinced that my lack of trust and control is the cause of the breakdown of our family. And it blows my mind that he is willing to let go of our daughter to continue watching porn. He doesn't see this. He's, uh, he doesn't see that him watching porn is an issue. Okay, so here's my advice. Run and run fast. You know, uh, you have two options here. And I've just had a client like this. Either get your husband into a treatment center where he is being guided and directed and challenged by professionals. Or you need to look at maybe how you're going to move on. Because, and, and I don't mean to be that directive. It's not my life. I don't know the answers. I can't really tell you what you should or shouldn't do. And I want to answer your question. But, um... I've worked with many, many, many men and women who have said, fuck it, I'm just gonna do what I want. And then 10 years later, five years later, 20 years later said, oh my God, I could have saved that relationship. Oh my God, I could have parented that child. But he isn't in that place. He's not conscious of what he has to lose. And so what I would say to you is, you know, what you said at the beginning, what typically pushes an addict to face reality and choose recovery, it is very simply, 
that the pain of the way they're living in addiction is greater than the pain of recovery. That they're willing to stop the, the pleasurable distractions, stop the intensity based, face their lies because th that life is just not working. And if your husband is having a grand old time having affairs and seeing other women and boy, that's probably a lot easier life than actually being a dedicated husband with a six year old around. Maybe he just wants to be a playboy and have his marriage too. But that's not what you want. And that's not what you want for your daughter. And you're absolutely right. So he make make you may make the right decision by moving away from him and protecting your child. And it could be years, if ever, before he realizes what he's lost. And I'm sorry for you for that. I wish that every addict could say, oh my God, I love this, but what am I thinking? But sometimes it's a year or two before they wake up and go, oh my God, they're not coming home? I, I was sure she would come home if I stayed away long enough. No, she ain't coming home. It, ta it takes what it takes. And, and I honestly, I wanna say to you with all respect, this may be, and it is true for some of the men I work with, his way of saying, I wanna move on. He may not want to be in this marriage with you. Clearly, he's willing to give up his daughter. Maybe you should let him. Um, and maybe this isn't what he wants. And you might have to face that fact, too. Um, now, he's just going to drive some other woman miserable, like he's driving you miserable. But that's not your problem. You already have a child to take care of. So I have every piece of empathy and compassion for you and your child. And, you know, I wish that I wish this, this man could understand the precious gift that he's been given in having a healthy family that he could celebrate and enjoy. I wish I could crack him over the head to understand that. But I also know that if he doesn't get it, you need to move on. And I want to just put in a plug for the Betrayed Partner drop-in group. So please join those uh, Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m. Pacific time and Sundays at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Th those are support places for uh, those of you um, who are betrayed partners to find other people to support you so um so two things just came up in the chat i want to come on if that's all right Tammy. someone says do i need to ask my question here on the forum ask your questions in the q a because that's where we read them mm -hmm. and um there's also someone made a comment and i want to comment on it someone said i'm not going to say who said it about this last share well maybe the guy didn't want the child in the first place women manipulate to get a child which husbands don't want and sir, I can say to you, I'm sure that you may, I, I don't know if you've had that experience. I'm sorry if you did, um, but I think everybody gets to make a choice. You know, there are many, many choices that we can make about how we live and what we do and, and how we raise our kids. And it, you know, there are many, many choices. And you know, a lot of times I've been presented with choices I didn't like. I've been presented with choices I didn't want, but there we were. And so I don't think that life is really about blaming or uh, blaming situations on others that I need to face. I think life is about taking on my own responsibilities head on, like it or not, and making good choices around them. Okay. Um, I was, then this works. Okay. Uh, hello and thank you guys for all you do. My question are coming from the position of a spouse who knew about the sex addiction before we married the past three years. We attempted to work on things ourselves using books, have had an entire relationship of rediscoveries, relapses, and failed attempts at recovery. The most recent discoveries involved watching porn at work with the history of offending type behavior or offending type porn, rape, incest, child being a problem. I told him he needs to get some serious treatment and I'm done working on this unless he goes to an intensive inpatient program. Is that too much to ask for reconciliation? Look, um, I admire and appreciate that you made a decision to go ahead in a relationship with someone who is broken in the ways that an addict is broken and a sex addict in particular. And I actually wrote, I'm sorry to promote books, but I did write a book about loving an addict called Prodependence. And it's a pretty good book that really validates, I think, people who love addicts because you love us for many, many reasons. It's not just our illness, but you, no one deserves abuse. No one deserves to be treated badly. No one deserves to feel unsafe in their home. No one uh, that I know of would want a spouse looking at images that are deeply disturbing and uh, may even not be legal in some cases. So, you know, I think you absolutely have a right to say, this is not something I want in my life at all. And this isn't something I want in the life of my partner. And um, you knew you were married a sex addict when you got started. That means your partner knew 
that he or she was a sex addict when they married you, I would assume that that means that you both make it, made a commitment that even though we see this issue, we're gonna work really hard to be a healthy couple. When I hear somebody, your spouse, saying things as you describe it like, we've had a relationship where he discovers relapses, failed attempts, um, watching porn at work, uh, uh, this is not a husband who is responding to the commitment that he made, I'm assuming at the beginning of your relationship, to work on this. Now, I do wanna say something to you, um, Tammy, you've, I've never said this here, but I'll say it. Um, I, I, um, how do I say this in a nice way? So I'm not always the nicest person. Tammy can tell you that. I have my moments. And there was a time when my husband had gained a bunch of weight that I wasn't so happy about this. And so I kept reminding him all the time of how he wasn't fitting in his clothes and he really needed to eat less and I really wasn't happy with how he'd gained weight. And, and I talked about that in therapy. And the therapist mentioned the word abusive. And I was like, me? Abusive? I'm just telling him he needs to, you know, stop eating all the ice cream. And she said to me, and I would say this to you, don't you think he knows that he's gained weight? Don't you think he feels bad about being overweight? Don't you think he wishes he could do something about it? And, you know, she's absolutely right. It's not like my spouse is running around saying, I'm so thrilled I don't fit in any of my clothes anymore. So what was I really doing? I was heaping shame and pain on top of an issue that he was aware of, he wanted to work on, and he was committed to. So that's a very different, I had to pull back and say, you know what? I'm being abusive. And as long as I've once expressed, maybe twice, my concerns about this, the rest is not up to me. And I'm not here to be a nagging, complaining, whining. That's not my job. So I would say to you also as a partner that many partners I work with and Tammy talks to describe having become someone they never wanted to be. I hear partners saying of alcoholics, of drug addicts, of sex addicts, all of us saying things like, I nag all the time, I complain all the time, I'm unhappy all the time, I'm miserable all the time, I feel untrusting, unsafe. And, and that is the result of living with an addict over time. So I think at a certain point, every spouse has to evaluate how healthy is it for me to continue to be in the situation that makes me feel so unhappy and that I feel so reactive to, and yet there's so little I seem to be able to do about it, especially if you're husband or spouse is not saying, hey, I'm going to go balls to the wall to make this better. And I don't understand in your question why your spouse is not saying, hey, what can I do to make this better? Is he really happy with what he's looking at and what he's doing? I can't imagine he is. So why would you have to threaten a divorce for him to start getting to work and get himself to treatment? That's the part I don't understand. And I'm not sure I know how to help with that piece. Well, and the other thing is he's watching porn at work, which involves all of this. And um, most companies do monitor these things. So not, I mean, beyond the relationship, he's also putting his career in jeopardy as well. It's oh, absolutely. And if, by the way, if this is someone with a license, like if your husband is a teacher or a doctor or a chiropractor, you know, if they're caught looking at a lot of porn by patients and get reported, they lose their license. So looking at porn in the workplace is not a great idea. Do you recommend a 90 day period of celibacy for couples in recovery? If so, what's the purpose and how do you stay connected intimately during that time? I, I definitely think that it is important for a sex addict to take a time out from sex. Um, not speaking about couples issues now, because for us leading so often in every situation with looking and flirting and manipulating what we wear and how we dress and how we talk to people. And there's just so much history of behavior that to simply stop I'm not gonna be having sex, I'm not gonna be sexual, I'm not gonna be hitting anyone, I'm not gonna, then it, it really can change how we act in the world. So for us sex addicts to take 60 days, 90 days, it also helps to, re, to address some of the neurobiological issues that happen when you reinforce a certain behavior in your brain, like looking at porn over and over and over again, um, you kind of have to get away from that um, behavior in order for it, long enough for it to seem less uh, enticing. So. I think sex addicts need to have a timeout. Couples, I, I, you know, I'm going to say that that really has to do with what's going on in your life and your world. This is what I say to every spouse I've ever worked with, every partner of a sex addict, male or female. If you want to have sex with your sexually addicted partner, here's my only criteria. Do you trust them? Because I don't want to have sex with someone I don't trust. And if you have not built trust in your relationship where you feel like 
for the most part, this person is trying to do good, looking out for your welfare, trying to get it right, even if they're not doing it perfectly. If you get a sense like in the last share that he doesn't give a shit and he's just going to do whatever he's going to do, then no, I don't, I wouldn't be sexual with that person, but not because there's a prescribed amount of time, but because you don't trust him. So the time tends to go with trust. It generally takes a good, you know, if I have betrayed you and hurt you and let you down and been lying to you, I guarantee it's probably going to be a little while before we end up having sex, probably a few months. And my hope is that you as my partner are having sex with me for the right reasons. I have worked with partners who think, well, if I just have all the sex, if I just have a lot of sex with him, then he won't go well off with other people. No. I've had partners say, well, if I just lose weight and I become this like goddess for him or God, then he won't be with other people. No. He had this problem before he ever met you, and it, you can dance on the head of a pin with a flute in your mouth, and he's still going to act out. So my question for you in terms of returning to intimacy in your relationship is, do you see him doing things that reassure you that he is really moving forward toward his recovery and doing what he needs to do to keep his side of the street clean? Because if I was seeing that, I would feel more comfortable moving toward being sexual. So I think for the addict, just to sum it up, it's a time out to take time out from sex altogether and really reassess who I am as a human being without all of that porn, all that sex. But for the partner, I think it's much more about, about developing trust and being sexual and romantic for the right reasons. Because I trust you, because I feel safe with you, because I want to grow something with you, not because I'm afraid you're going to run somewhere if I don't have a lot of sex with you. Um, and finally, how do you stay connected intimately during that time? There are a lot of things you can do without having sex to be intimate. Intimacy, first of all, has nothing to do with sex. I know that you guys think it does, but it doesn't. Intimacy is defined. And I'll tell you why. I can have sex with 100 people and be completely non-intimate. They've been in and out of every one of my body parts, but I haven't been intimate because I never let them into my heart, into my mind, and into my soul. Intimacy is defined by your knowing me, everything about me, and my accepting that response, love or hate or, you know, and that you, I'm willing to, and that you're willing to be open to me and you're risking that I might not like you or I might, I might abandon you or I might not want to, the more vulnerable and open I am with you, the more intimate I am being with you. And that has nothing to do with sex. So, and by the way, if you want physical intimacy, you know, you can hold hands, you can give massages, you can cuddle and spoon, you can give him a bath, you can, he can wash your hair. There are a million ways that you can be physically intimate and emotionally intimate without having intercourse. And honestly, for most couples, I think there's way too much emphasis on the intercourse. Thank you. Okay, the next question, um, I'm going to edit it just a little bit. So this person's in an inpatient treatment center with the focus on drugs and alcohol. Uh, the counselor is a trained therapist for um, sex addiction, but overwhelmingly I'm feeling underserved because I don't have the space to talk about what's going on with me. Coming with a porn addiction, AA and NA aren't the forums for me to really talk about in detail about my struggle and loss. I've been thinking I'd be better served taking the money I'm spending to do inpatient and getting a long-term counselor and finding a recovery community back home. And so then he would said, like your input. And then he said, I, would, I want to add I'm not a drug addict. Okay. So let me explain. So for everyone, if you want, if you believe that treatment, some kind of residential or inpatient treatment is useful or needed because you're out of control or your partner's out of control because the conflict is so great that you need some time out because drug use or other addictions have crossed with the sex. And now the, you know, if you, if the person really needs help, there are a couple of criteria for me for picking a treatment center. Number one, they need to have a dedicated program for sex addiction, where there are five or six other people who are there just for sex addiction, excuse me, or at least they're there for profoundly co-occurring issues with drugs and sex. Your average drug and alcohol center is not gonna be a place where you're gonna get to work on that. It doesn't matter that you have a, a therapist who is understanding. What you need is the group. You need to be able to walk into a group and say, of oh, the group that you're in, and I know you're not gonna walk into this group of drug addicts you're sitting with in group and say, oh my God, I've been masturbating four times a day. Well, if you can't say that, then you're in the wrong group. So it is sad for me to say to you, you probably picked the wrong treatment center. And I don't know, you know, I don't know you, so I don't, let, let me say, you might be pulling a whole line of bullshit on us and wanting some excuse for getting out of there. But if what you say is correct, then, I have strong feelings about treatment centers luring anybody in who will come for their dollar. 
And I think that our field has done a great disservice by treating all addictions like alcohol and drugs because they're all different and they all require different forms of treatment, as do combined addictions like, like food and sex or alcohol, you know, all of that. So yes, specialty treatment would allow you to feel much safer, allow you to really go through and set an agenda for what you need to do. And whether you do that at home or you do that with us or you do that with someone else, you know, Tammy has lots of guides and you can write her. Um, I don't, by the way, I don't, I don't mean to undermine. I'm sure that there are, there are things you get in treatment. You, you make friends, you learn about addiction, you are in a structured environment, you get support, you get evaluated for other issues. All the things happen, but I think what you most need to do which is be with people who have the issue you have in the same way you have it, you don't have that. And that is like cutting yourself off at the, at the I don't know, cutting yourself off from the deep connection that you really need in treatment. So I, I can't tell you whether to stay or not, you know, that's up to you. And I certainly don't want some treatment center clinical director calling me and saying, you told my client not to stay. I don't wanna be involved. <laughs> but I will say that I, you need to trust your gut and you need to feel safe and if you really believe that you were doing your sincere best to bring this forward and the environment you're in is not receiving it in a way that supports you, leave, go home, get into, go to another treatment center, find what you need. Um, you don't have to stay. And after a week or two, I think you're pretty much going to know whether it works or not. And, and I do want to say, you know, just like some therapists work for some people and other, some treatment centers are great. Some people like places that have a hundred beds and lots of people in big cafeterias. And it's like a huge institution with a lot. Some people like really small places where there's only six or eight. And it really is. And, and I, I hate to make an example of this person anyway, but they have made themselves an example by, for whatever reasons, not necessarily choosing a program that was mirrored to their problems. And as a result, they're sitting in treatment saying, I don't feel safe. I don't belong. Here's the thing, addicts, we never feel safe and we always feel like we don't belong. We can go to the par a party for us and feel like we're the only one who isn't connected to everyone else. That's part of our problem. So the less interference there is in treatment with my feeling comfortable dealing with my issues, the more trusting it's gonna be, the safer it's gonna be and the better I'm gonna do. So I do suggest that, and here's an idea for you. If you're in treatment and you're here, then you actually are getting some things while you're in treatment. There's also a Friday group that I do. There's also drop-in groups. There's all of the 12-step meetings for sexual recovery are online. There's SA meetings, SNON meetings, all of that. So you could ask your treatment center if they could put together a little bit more of a program that would allow you access to other sex addicts, like by going to online sex addiction meetings. At five o'clock California time every Friday, there is an SAA meeting on intherooms.com. Now I'm on at six. Um, you could have two solid hours of sex addiction recovery and, you know, whatever it is while you're in the treatment center um, by doing something like that. But if the team is not willing to support you in that way, quite honestly, I'm not sure why you're there in that particular place. And I'm sorry, and I will say, and I will stop. T Tammy, you don't have so much energy on this, right? We both have been in the field a long time, and it's been incredibly frustrating to Tammy and I to see money went out over good care to see that people are lured into places or encouraged to go places. And I'm not talking about this place. I don't know what it is, but that people will end up going places for help that, that they were kind of sold a bill of goods. Like, Oh, we treat all addictions and we can help you. And we help alcoholics. It's not true. You need to be in an environment that is specialized and focused on the issue that you have with people who have the issue you have. Otherwise it just isn't good treatment. And that's, that's the way it goes. Yeah. I have, I've told lots of people we're not, you know, we don't do everything. You know, the Seeking Integrity program is for men with sex addiction and intimacy disorders or co-occurring sex addiction and chemical dependency. That's it. You know, we're not, we're not treating everything. We're not, you know, we don't pretend to. So. And I think it's important. You have to realize that online, because the business aspect of the recovery field has been so pushed out in the last 10 years that you'll often look online and every treatment center looks like they treat everything. And every treatment center looks like they offer everything. And every treatment center has smiling, happy faces and beautiful views of the ocean or the mountains or wherever that treatment center is. And what does that have to do with treatment? So treatment centers have gotten extraordinarily good at marketing and, uh, and making people uh, believe in what they have to sell. But that doesn't mean that they're actually giving it. You have to determine that on a case-by-case -case basis. One more thing. Um, go somewhere where there's an expert. 
I mean, you want to know, be guaranteed you're going to get the right help. Go somewhere where somebody wrote a book or somebody's run a program before or somebody has done this work. So you know you're going to an expert. Don't just go to a place that advertises that they do this work. Because everybody does advertise that they do this work. So, Thank okay. You. All right, we move on. I have left my SAX. We worked together for 10 years. It has now turned ugly. We have a CPTSD from 10 years of betrayal. Oh, I have CPTSD. What does that mean? C, what is CPTSD? I don't know. What is CPS? It's, um, it's complex. It's related oh, to early yeah. childhood trauma. Okay, okay so thank you. Just for everyone. So PTSD is like yeah. I was at war, but CPTSD is I grew up in a horrible childhood and had trauma. Okay, thank you. From 10 years of betrayal, gaslighting, multiple HIV tests, finding porn on my computer, um, uh, I canceled his cell phone because I realized both phones were under my social security number and account. He looked at porn sites and exchanged photos as well as arranged for meetings with sex and uh, prostitutes, but also visited porn sites that had um, the word boy in them, and I am worried that he was looking at underage boys, children. He has no intention of admitting any of this and has moved on to his next victim. I am exhausted, understandably. I am working on myself, but I'm scared and I don't know my rights. I hope that makes sense. He's turned mean. So tell me, what do you think is the concern regarding rights here? I'm not sure I understand. I, I is think- concerned the, that there might be something on her computer? Yes, that, it sounds like I'm concerned because it was under my account. Um, with the, you know, with the information and it sounds like there was underage, um, you know, child porn. So, so this is what I would do. I would consult an attorney. I would shut down those accounts if it were me. And I, I used to, you know, I, any computer that's been involved in underage or inappropriate porn needs to be trashed and burned. You know, that hard drive needs to be because if the police or FBI get involved, they will extract the information somehow. And so, you know, I, I would clean house but I wouldn't do any cleaning of house before I went to an attorney. And I said, look, this is what I've been through. This is what I think my, I don't want to get accused of this. Make a record of what you're finding and what you know to be true with another legal, with a legal professional so that you can, you know, if for some reason they were to come to you, you could say, look, I went to the lawyer three years ago. This is what I knew you guys would find this eventually. And this is what I did. And I've documented all of it. Um, but I think you don't know your rights and that's a really good reason to go find your rights, which means you need to talk to an attorney. Um, it's important. And I think that that would give you some peace of mind too, because you know, I'm confident that there are, you know, like you said, the documenting and making sure that you've done that, then you have a little peace of mind. So. Also, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the laws are about marriage anymore. They've changed so much, but if you live together for 10 years, do you have a communal marriage? Are you actually married by, uh, you know, some states consider you married if you live with someone for a period of time. So I would really want to know what are the legal rights that I have having lived with someone for 10 years? It is a good question. And it varies from state to state. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, should I fear for my young daughter and or protect her from escalating behavior from her addict father? Currently, I do not see, um, I did not see illegal child porn, but at this point, I don't know what to expect. This is a great question and one that I hear from a lot of spouses who have young children and they find out that their husband is a sex addict or their boyfriend. And, you know, I understand that if you hear something that sounds like out of control sexual behavior, if someone's out of control, then how out of control are they? And could that spill over into my children, my family? And I can only tell you my experience, which is that um, people who have... Um, that's not really what I want to say. What do I want to say? Um, I have rarely found someone who was regularly looking at adult porn and didn't really have interest in child porn become some kind of dedicated child porn user and then move on to her children. I just never, if you look at the research, this is what I can reassure you with. The research on people who look at child porn and don't touch children is very, um, is very different than you might imagine. Even among those people who look at child porn, very few of them actually touch, like unless they have a history of touching or a history of offending. So the person who's looking at images and finds some images and they kind of like them and they're underage, they're very unlikely to touch. They may end up looking and getting in trouble, but they're very unlikely to touch. And I understand the fear of, oh my God, are my children at risk? What I would worry about or think not at all he's going to touch them in the shower. I mean, if you've never felt unsafe with your spouse before, I wouldn't feel unsafe now in that way. But what I would worry about is 
Are the kids gonna go over to the computer and find something that I don't want them to find? Are they gonna pick up the phone and hear daddy saying things that, is daddy gonna be somewhere and acting out in some way that they see? with a prostitute or flirting with someone at Starbucks or those are the things that I would worry about. I'm not so worried about his behavior with your children. You would know, you really would know. I'm pretty darn sure. Um, but I mean, and, and I've rarely seen that very, very rarely. And I've been doing this for 25 years where somebody who ended up looking at this decided to touch their children or touch any children. It's highly unusual. Most sex addicts are not aggressive in that way. We're actually much more passive. We flirt, we hit on, we, but if somebody said, I'm uncomfortable, we'd run away. Like, we don't want to make people uncomfortable. We want people to adore us. So we are, um, it's not typical for a, an adult male who's looking at a lot of adult male porn to suddenly turn around and start some interest in, in underage. It just is highly unlikely. And I wouldn't have that fear, but I would discuss it with him. And I would say to him, as long as you're looking at that stuff and it seems out of control, I'm probably going to continue to have this fear. And that might help goad him into some recovery. So um, the person that said that he's moved on to the next victim, she said, I'm also, I worry about the daughter of the woman he is now seeing. Well, so I'll say something else to you, other person. I mean, I wasn't going to go there, but you certainly can go to the police and say, I was involved with someone and they were looking at a whole bunch of inappropriate images and it terrifies me because now they're not in my life, but they're on my, and now he's moved on to someone else and I don't know what this means. You certainly can report to the police. And if they find images of underage on the computer that your husband or boyfriend accessed, they're probably going to do something about it. But the problem with that is I'm not always sure when I go to the police how they're gonna respond or what they're gonna do. And so I really think you're better off with a lawyer. Um, and you know, I, I can't, I understand the desire to help someone else not end up where you have ended up or for their children to be at risk. But the truth is, is that you, it's not your job to inform anyone in letting, I mean, that's, they're going to find out what they're going to find out. They made a choice to be in a relationship with this person. They knew that this person had a troubled relationship and went on to the next one. So they know this person has issues. It's not your job to, you have enough on your side of the table that you need to clean up without worrying about what he's doing with someone else. That's on him and them. Next question. SA male, 18 months after discovery of a long affair and 15 after disclosure. We are older, long time married. I attend AA 32 regular yes. and, yeah, and SLAA weekly. Have a sponsor. We have done a lot of recovery work. Listen to out of the doghouse and pro-dependence often and try to live it. My wife is still very hurt and fearful. I get it. I did it. The hard part is she still rags on me and I have not been able to create boundaries. I am in for the long haul. Well, I, you know, if you're at an active process of healing, I admire you both and give you both credit. And, you know, I do understand that sometimes spouses, part, female partners, sometimes when, we, when it gets on, when you're getting on like a year that you've been in recovery, you've really been working on it. You've been owning your stuff. You've been doing your part. You, when we get to about nine months in a year and that partner, if they are as acutely angry as they were in the beginning and you're really doing nothing or very little to gain that anger or garner that anger, you know, what I will sometimes to say to spouses is at some point your anger can become counterproductive and it will start to push the person away that you say you want to heal and be with. And I'm not saying that you're the person who can say that to your spouse, but I do think actually, I take that back. I think you can. I think you can actually say, you know, mm -hmm. um, we're a year into this and I've been working on this. And when you're, when I experience your rage at the same level as, as day one, um, it feels really defeating. It's hard for me to want to hope that things are going to get better. You do need to communicate to her how it's leaving you feeling. And ultimately the two of you probably need to get into some couples counseling and work on this. Um, I do want to say also for all of the spouses that are betrayed that no one expects you, certainly least of all me, to forgive and forget ever. You know, that's not going to happen. I mean, if you, if I trusted you and you have betrayed me in such a profound way, I'm never going to forget that. I might forgive, but I'm never going to forget. And I think for this gentleman or this woman, part of what you need to understand is your relationship will never be the same. The, the trust, the, the stability, the this person would always have my back and never hurt me is gone. And what you're left with is looking at a broken person who's 
kind of broken up your marriage and and it's a lot of work ahead so um i guess I, tammy's going to do a better job of saying this than me but if you're in it for the long haul you know um i would look for the ripples versus the you know ripples on the surface versus the deep moving tides i know from being in a relationship for 20 years is the greatest, the greatest thing about being in a long-term relationship is that if i was in a relationship for three months and somebody had a terrible week I would think, oh my God, I don't want to be with them. Look, a whole week they were like this. But if I'm with someone for 20 years and they have a terrible week, eh, it's just a week. So for you to begin to recognize with your spouse, what are just the ripples on the surface of her rage and the remaining distrust? And what are deeper, stiller waters that involve connection to you? And can you talk about both of those together and not just the ones on the surface? Um, you guys have work to do. This is not an easy process, but I have hope when I hear you express things in the way that you did. And I have a great suggestion for you, I think. So I do the webinar with John Taylor on Mondays at noon. And he has such great practical tools to use for working on relationships. I would invite the two of you to listen to them together, discuss them. He did one on negotiation the other day, not, not this Monday, the, the week before. It was really good. And it, it was one of those things, we even brought it back up today. We were talking about how practical that is and how it can help, um, like I can decide, is this really something I'm going to go for to the map with? Some of it is, you know, yeah, some of it's a really big boundary and it's really important. Some of it is I'm just taking my heels in and, you know, I really value the relationship more than I need to have that win, you know? So, right. so I would really encourage you to do that. The podcast, we've referred to it before, the podcast with um, Dr. Stan Tat, can we do it's about, you know, the relationship. If I do things that are good for the relationship and sometimes, you know, like I don't really want to do it. This would be, this would be my preference, but it's better for the relationship if I do it this way. You know, honestly, some of those things, it's just kind of shifting the lens of, you know, how I look at things. So, so I, like Dr. Rob said, I encourage you. I love that you guys are in it for the long haul, but you know, like it, I, I would love it if you're looking at each other and going like, I'm glad I'm in it for the long haul with you right. rather than like, dang, you know, so, so keep coming back, check out some of those resources there on sex and relationship healing.com. Um, we've got, go ahead. And by the way, I really see, you know, if your spouse is not actively raging at you addicts, I think it's really important to have the hard conversations if they're not an active rage, it doesn't mean, okay, well, let's just watch TV and pretend nothing bad happened. If your spouse is not actively raging at you, and I know the last thing you want to do is bring up difficult things, how much they would respect, I believe, if you said, we're in a good place tonight, so I want to ask you, what are the main things that my cheating, what are the main ways my cheating has affected you? Or what are the, the ways in which you doubt yourself? Like, be curious about their experience, because a lot of times we're just like, stop yelling at me, stop saying, and and we don't give them a chance to really tell us what's going on with them. So if you might choose some calm moments to inv investigate, really useful. And Tammy, you didn't mention timeouts, but I'm going to mention that. Um, mm -hmm. Any of the couples who are on line tonight or, you know, individuals, if you're struggling with a spouse who's reactive or you're reactive, um, you might just need some time and that's okay. Not all of us are capable of being the calm, rational person we wanna be in the moment, I promise you. I work with Tammy, she tells me all the time. <laughs> so, um, but can you say, you know what, I'm really heated, we're really heated up right now. Um, it's six o'clock, I'll meet you back here at 6.30, I'm gonna go for a walk. And then you absolutely do come back and meet and see if things are too hot to talk about. It's called a timeout, very basic part of couples therapy. And it may well be, you know, we need to table this discussion till tomorrow because we're too upset. doesn't mean we're not going to talk about it, but negotiating the disagreement and figuring out how we can have healthy conflict is part of the process. And actually, John Taylor has some great tools and he talks about the timeout. So, yes. And all of those are recorded, right, Tammy? All of those are recorded. So there's a whole library of these that you can find. So. Okay. Great. I've learned lots for those. So uh, can, can we take one more? There's one I one more. I will, more. I will allow my hunger for dinner to go unabated. Okay, for... Thank you. All right. I have just discovered that my father has been going to a massage parlor, though I'm not sure he's a sex addict. My partner is an SA. Is there a connection between the two? Was I subconsciously attracted to my partner because he reminded me of my father, even the bad parts that I hate about my father? Wow. I know. That's why I wanted you to. Well... I think it's really important for you as a spouse not to be questioning why you chose to love somebody. I wrote a book about this called Pro-Dependence, and 
one of my issues with sort of what you're hinting around out there, which I would call codependency, is what in my background made me choose this person and was I destined to end up in this situation? And I don't know, I don't think so. And I don't think it matters. What matters is, are there things you still love in this person? Were you right to love them? Are there ways that your love could be more successful, more productive and healthier? Um, I doubt that you made some awful decision to marry or get involved with this person. Um, as far as your dad's concerned, you know, I'm sorry that you saw that. And I have to tell you, there's a lot of massage parlors in this world and a lot of strip clubs, and there's a lot of men who are going to them. And I don't believe that every one of them is a sex addict. So do men occasionally go for casual sex outside of their relationships? If they didn't, there wouldn't be strip clubs, massage parlors, all those places. And they can't all be single men that are going to them. So, but does that mean he's an addict? No. Does it mean that your father has the ability to lie to your mom? And well, we don't know. Because for all you know, he may have made an agreement with her that it's okay for him to go to get a massage once a month or I don't know. So I wouldn't read anything into your dad's behavior because you're an adult and he's an adult and what he does is kind of his business and between him and your mom. But um, what's going on in your relationship, that's what's important. And I wouldn't look to how I have mischosen this person. I would start looking at how did I make the right decision in choosing them? Because that's what you want to look for if you want to stay, right? Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm typing. Um, uh, so let me tell everybody that Tammy sits in a lot of the drop-in groups to monitor them and support them. So you're going to run into her in a lot of the different groups. Um, you'll also find us on the on the podcast. Tammy does a couple of those. And um, is my sidekick in all things recovery. So thank you, Tammy, for doing this tonight. Thank you. And for those of you, I you know, thank you for all the great questions. Sorry, we ran out of time, but Dr. David Fawcett is online on Wednesday night. So he, he's a great resource. He does a, a great webinar as well. And otherwise join um, Dr. Rob, I typed in the in the rooms link. You do need to register for that in advance. You need to, to sign in. So um, otherwise come back next Monday night and we'll see you then. Bye guys. Thanks everybody, bye. bye.